Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. Today we're going to look at how the Moon changes appearance, giving us eclipses and phases, and also how it affects the Earth, giving us tides. An eclipse happens when three astronomical bodies line up, such as the Earth, the Moon and the Sun. The middle body can block the two end bodies from seeing each other, just as you can't see your friend from behind a wall. A solar eclipse happens during a new moon, which we'll cover later. The moon blocks the sun's light from reaching observers on the Earth. There are a few diagrams in this video. Please bear in mind that most are nowhere near to scale. We see here the moon's orbit around the Earth. Once a month, the moon gets between us and the sun. We can see a small region, including part of the Earth's surface, that the sun's rays can't reach. This dark patch is called the umbra, Latin for shadow. Think of an umbrella which can shade you from rain and sun. Off to the side is the penumbra. This is where the moon blocks some, but not all, of the sun's rays. From the umbra you'll see a total eclipse, and from the penumbra you'll see a partial eclipse. You may be asked to sketch an eclipse diagram in the exam. It's easy to get right if you know a simple trick. It's tempting to draw the earth, moon and sun first. If you do, you might find that the light rays don't line up properly. Here, the umbra doesn't reach the Earth. Instead, draw the Sun and Earth first, and then draw the light rays. Now you can add the Moon in to fit exactly within the rays. It's not to scale, so you can put the Moon anywhere that works. Just make sure that it's smaller than the Earth. Warning, do not look directly at the Sun. Even a few seconds can cause temporary damage to your eye, and any longer can cause permanent damage. Your eyes can't feel pain, so you won't know until it's too late. If you look at the sun through binoculars or a telescope, the focused sunlight can reach thousands of degrees Celsius, cooking your eye before you can even blink. In an eclipse, there's less visible light, so your pupil opens up. This makes it even worse, as it lets in more ultraviolet. A lot of people have been harmed by looking at a total eclipse then the eclipse ends and floods their dark adapted eyes with visible infrared and ultraviolet light. You can get specialist solar viewing glasses which filter out the harmful parts of the spectrum. But make sure you buy proper safe glasses and check that they conform to regulations. Don't use the free glasses that come with newspapers every time there's an eclipse. On the left here we can see a total eclipse. The main disk of the bright sun is hidden and we can see the corona that surrounds it. Usually the sun is too bright to see this. On the right is a partial eclipse. It's just possible to make out some features of the moon, from light reflected by the Earth. Here we can see the progression of a solar eclipse over time. From left to right we see an increasing partial eclipse, then the total eclipse, then a decreasing partial eclipse. A total eclipse can last up to seven minutes, from the very start to the very end, the eclipse lasts a few hours. Total eclipses occur because, by coincidence, the Sun is 400 times the size of the Moon, but also 400 times further away. This means they appear the same size in the sky, about half a degree across. But the Moon's orbit is elliptical, not circular. Sometimes it's a bit closer, and sometimes it's a bit further away. If an eclipse happens when the Moon is quite distant, it doesn't cover the entire Sun, and we see a ring shape, called an annular eclipse. Now because the Moon has some quite big mountains, valleys and craters, sometimes the Sun can peek through the valleys during a total eclipse. When the Sun peeks through one large valley, we see a diamond ring effect. And when the Sun is seen between several valleys and mountains, we see Bailey's beads. You should be able to sketch these in the exam. Here we see the 2017 total eclipse from South Carolina, USA. The moon is just about to cover the sun. That wasn't a real flash, the camera is just adjusting to the light levels. And then we see a diamond ring. When the moon blocks the diamond ring effect, we see the full total eclipse. And the corona is visible. A solar eclipse can have strange effects on wildlife. I watched the 1999 eclipse from the beach, and all the seagulls went to sleep. They were very confused when night time 
ended after just two minutes. Lunar eclipses are very similar, but happen during a full moon, when the Earth blocks the sun's light from reaching the moon. The Earth is much bigger, so the entire moon is usually in the umbra. Here are two photos taken by the same camera on the same night. The right image shows the normal full moon, but in the left image, the moon is in the Earth's penumbra, the shape of which is drawn on the diagram. Note that the moon in the penumbra is darker, especially at the top of the image where it's deeper into the penumbra. Here we have a total lunar eclipse, sometimes called a blood moon. Our atmosphere refracts light around the Earth, so some light still gets through. Red light refracts more than the other colours, and the moon gets a blood red appearance. This video shows a total lunar eclipse in Slovenia in 2018, from just before totality to just after. It's sped up quite a bit. Although it's slightly cloudy, we can clearly see the moon change both colour and shape as the eclipse progresses. You should know the main stages of an eclipse. I won't go into great detail here, as I already covered it in my video on the size and distance of the Earth, Moon and Sun, where Eratosthenes used lunar eclipses to calculate the Moon's diameter. We'll look at umbral contacts, labelled U in the diagram. You don't need to know about penumbral contacts, labelled P, for the GCSE. First umbral contact, or U1, is when the Moon starts to enter Earth's umbra. Second umbral contact, U2, is when the Moon has fully entered Earth's umbra. Third umbral contact, U3, is when the Moon starts to leave Earth's umbra. And fourth umbral contact, U4, is when the Moon has fully left Earth's umbra. We can apply the same principle to a solar eclipse. First umbral contact is when the Moon appears to touch the Sun. Second umbral contact is when the Moon fully covers the Sun. Third umbral contact is when the Moon starts to uncover the Sun. And fourth umbral contact is when the Moon fully leaves the Sun. A solar eclipse lasts from first to fourth umbral contact, usually a few hours. But the total eclipse lasts only from the second to the third umbral contact, only a few minutes. I said earlier that a solar eclipse occurs at new moon and a lunar eclipse occurs at full moon. Since these happen every month, why don't we get a solar and lunar eclipse every month? Every orbiting body has an orbital plane, a two-dimensional plane of its elliptical orbit. The Earth has an orbital plane around the Sun, and the Moon has an orbital plane around the Earth. But these planes aren't in line with each other. The Moon's orbital plane is inclined, or tilted, about 5 degrees. Most months, the Moon passes too far above or too far below the Sun at the times of new and full moons to give us an eclipse. The shadow misses us. Now it's time to talk about the phases of the Moon. The Moon is tidally locked to us. See my video on the Moon's appearance and features. So we always see the same side, but it does change its appearance over a month. We can see the Moon because it's lit by the Sun, but the Sun only lights up half of the Moon at a time. The half that we can see isn't necessarily the half that's lit up so part of the near side is usually dark. The parts we see lit up change as the Moon orbits the Earth. These images show how the Moon appears to us at different parts of its orbit. Ignore the wobbling or libration and the changes in the Moon's size. Again, see my other video for explanations of these. There are eight main stages of the lunar phase cycle and you should be able to recognise, name and draw each of them. A drawing in the GCSE exam is just a circle with a light section and a dark section. We say the lunar phase starts when the moon is completely dark, a new moon. A few days later we see a small sliver. This is called a crescent. Waxing means increasing or getting bigger, so this is a waxing crescent. We then reach first quarter, where half of the moon is lit. Gibbous means swollen, so the next one is waxing gibbous. Then we reach full moon, also called second quarter. Waning means decreasing, so our next moon is waning gibbous. We reach another half moon at third quarter. Next is waning crescent. 
and finally we get back to New Moon, also called Fourth Quarter. The boundary between the light and dark sides of the moon is called the Terminator. This is true for any planet or moon. On the moon, just like almost every planet and moon in our solar system, the Terminator moves across the surface from east to west. From the Earth's northern hemisphere, it appears to move from right to left. Look at the large picture of the moon. The right part is lit and the left part is dark, so as the Terminator moves to the left, more of the moon will be illuminated. This is a waxing gibbous moon. In the southern hemisphere, this is reversed. The moon appears upside down and the Terminator appears to move from left to right. In the GCSE, a UK exam, the northern hemisphere answer is the correct one. A lot of people confuse lunar eclipses with the phases of the moon, but not you. They look different and are caused by different events. Look at the pair of photos on the left. Even without the difference in colour, we can clearly see which is which. The gibbous moon at the top appears to bulge out a bit to the left, where the bottom picture shows the round shadow of the Earth, as though somebody took a bite out of a cookie. On the right, the shape is a bit less obvious, but there is a definite difference between the crescent moon at the top and the large round shadow of the Earth on the bottom. Our last big topic for today is tides. For the GCSE, you are expected to know only a simplified version of this very complex topic. This diagram shows the Earth and the Moon. All objects with mass exert gravitational attraction on all other objects in the universe, meaning that the Moon pulls the Earth, although quite weakly as its mass is fairly low compared with the Earth's mass. We're going to ignore the force of the Earth on the Moon here. Also, bear in mind that the Moon orbits the Earth, so they aren't going to crash into each other. The pink arrow shows the Moon's gravitational pull. The Earth has oceans, so let's put those in. The Moon pulls the oceans too. The water nearest the Moon is pulled more strongly than the Earth, and the water on the other side is pulled less strongly. This causes the oceans to stretch in the directions towards and away from the Moon. This additional water comes from the surface of the Earth that's in the middle. The Earth spins once a day, so every day, each location on the Earth gets two high tides and two low tides. The Sun does the same thing to us. The Sun is much more massive than the Moon, but it's much further away, so its tidal effect is only about half as strong. When the Sun, Earth and Moon are aligned, at full Moon or New Moon, their gravity adds together. High tide is even higher, and low tide is even lower. These are called spring tides. When the Sun and Moon make a 90 degree angle in the sky, at first or third quarter moons, the Sun's gravity partly cancels out the effects of the Moon's gravity. High and low tides are less extreme. These are called neap tides. So we have large spring tides twice a month, at full and new moon, and small neap tides, at first and last quarter moon. This is the explanation you need for GCSE astronomy. In the real world, tides are incredibly complex. This model is only correct for a completely smooth planet entirely covered by ocean. If you're interested, I've linked to an excellent PBS Space Time video that gives you a more complete explanation. That's our three main topics covered, eclipses, phases and tides. I've just got two more things to tell you about the Moon, and we'll cover those pretty quickly. The first is the length of a month and we have two different months to consider. Neither of them is the same length as a calendar month. The sidereal month is the time it takes the Moon to complete one orbit of the Earth. This is about 27.3 days, and is the same time the Moon takes to rotate once. However, in a month, we've moved quite a bit in our orbit. The Sun appears to be in a different place in the sky. If we see a new Moon, and then wait one sidereal month, the Moon will be out of sync, and will have to orbit us a bit more to give us our next new Moon. The time between new Moons is the synodic month, also known as the solar month, or lunar phase cycle. It's about two days longer than the sidereal month, at 29.5 days. You need to learn both of these figures, as they are not given to you in the exam. And finally, the lunar distance method. For a bit of background to this, see my video on celestial coordinates. Until the 18th century, 
sailors didn't have a good way of finding their longitude. Clocks of the time would fail as the ship rocked back and forth. Then, in 1763, the lunar distance method was developed. As the moon orbits the Earth, it moves across the sky relatively quickly, at about half a degree per hour. Navigators would use a sextant to measure the angular distance between the moon and an easily identifiable bright star. Regulus was a popular choice. Then they looked up the angular distance in a book. This book had pre-calculated tables that showed the current time at Greenwich for that angle. With that, and other bits of information discussed in my other video, they could figure out their longitude. And that's it. If you've watched my other moon videos, you now know everything you need to know about the moon for the Astronomy GCSE. These screens are a summary of everything you need to know from this video. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.